Professor Dominique Guerrero from France, who will be presenting to us today uh, on hypertension in ADPKD. Uh, Dominique is the uh, uh, head of nephrology uh, at the Rouen University in France since 2015. Uh, he's uh, had a, has an M MSc and a PhD, and his research interests are mainly focused on arterial hypertension endothelial dysfunction and uh, polycystic kidney disease. Uh, he has, you know, authored over 100 publications. Uh, he's an active member of several societies uh, in, and uh, also the, um, uh, uh, he's leading the Nephro Audio Medit podcast program that I'll have to now listen to. I just found that out this morning. So welcome, uh, Dominique. Thank you very much, Swapnil. Thank you uh, to all of you for having me here uh, with you this morning. Um, so, yeah, it's my pleasure to speak uh, with you uh, about hypertension in ADPKD. And I would say in the broader context, the cardiovascular disorders in ADPKD, the specific focus would, of course, be on hypertension. Now, as you all know, the main uh, disease disorder in ADPKD is kidney uh, disease, and this is related to the uh, progressive occurrence and growth of cysts within the kidney. And these cysts uh, occur because of genetic disturbances, and they concern mainly polycystin 1, so PKD1 gene, and polycystin 2, encoded by PKD2 gene, and more rarer, seldom uh, genes are also implicated uh, in this disease. And as you uh, most certainly know, there is a, a progressive decrease in GFR over the time, which uh, is responsible for the fact that uh, ADPKD is the leading cause of uh, genetic uh, and stage kidney disease in our uh, countries. Now, of course, uh, Disorders in ADPKD are not only related to the kidney, and today I'd like to speak about the cardiovascular disorders uh, that are present in uh, ADPKD. Now, we'll focus on arterial hypertension in the major part of, uh, of this presentation and, and discussion. But before that, because this is uh, not just hypertension in ADPKD, there, there is uh, uh, important things to discuss about other uh, disorders in the heart, so for instance, left ventricular hypertrophy, valvular diseases, pericardial effusion that can happen in ADPKD more frequently than in other kidney uh, diseases, and especially uh, other disorders in arteries. The main one, of course, is the uh, presence of uh, uh, intracranial artery aneurysms. Now, I'd like to start with uh, the good news. Uh, the good news is that here in this uh, Registry, when you compare cardiovascular mortality in patients with ADPKD, this is, this is a black line, and in non-ADPKD CKD patients, these are patients on dialysis, you can see that the, the CV cardiovascular mortality was higher in the ADPKD patients in the initial stages of this registry, but it tends to decrease with time. And uh, right now, while we, it is very important to speak about cardiovascular disorders in ADPKD, this is, tends to be slightly decreasing in, in terms of, uh, of uh, cause of mortality as compared to the other populations with the chronic kidney disease. And this is an interesting thing we could discuss, probably because we better understand the pathophysiology of, uh, of these disorders and that the uh, therapeutic management is actually uh, tackling this, uh, this aspect of the disease. Now, first of all, a few words about intracranial aneurysms in ADPKD, which is the let's say, the best-known vascular disorder in, the, in this genetic disease. These are historical cohorts that are useful to see how frequent uh, intracranial aneurysms are in asymptomatic patients with ADPKD. Well, you can see the, the detection rate in these patients is from 9 to 14 percent, which is approximately seven times more as compared to the general population. And this is about Durbond, a bit more than Durbond, when you take patients with a family history of intracranial uh, aneurysms, which is which reflects uh, on the one hand the fact that the polycystin, the mutations in PKD1 or PKD2 are a factor that uh, contributes to the genesis of arter intracranial uh, artery aneurysms, but also that you have uh, other factors on top of that, other genetically driven factors that will aggravate this phenotype. And one of the uh, particular things in ADPKD is that the uh, aneurysms are mainly located in the anterior circulation. So this is, these are quite uh, old studies. And let's focus now on a meta-analysis that has been published more recently, which brings uh, 
in interesting information. In this meta-analysis, they compared patients with ADPKD from three different cohorts to uh, controls we, who, which did not have uh, ADPKD. And um, well, the prevalence of hypertension, which we'll discuss in the major part of this, uh, of this presentation, was of course much higher in patients with ADPKD. This is not a surprise. Uh, the family history was also uh, more frequent in patients with ADPKD. An interesting thing here is that you have a uh, more frequent occurrence of uh, aneurysms in the anterior uh, circulation of, uh, of the brain as compared to patients that do not have ADPKD. Now, you, you cannot be certain of why this happens, but it, uh, it could ring a bell when you remember that uh, the polycystins, they are very important proteins in the physiology of the uh, cilia, and these cilia play a role in the mechanotransduction. So the mechanotransduction of urine in the, in the kidney, but also of blood in the arteries. So if you have disturbed mechanotransduction in the arteries, then it could be uh, quite logical that in the arteries that have the most important blood flow, so the most important shear stress, then you have more disturbances. So that probably could be an explanation to why patients with ADPKD have a a uh, predominant location in the uh, anterior arteries. And of course, I'm speaking from France, so uh, speaking about uh, ADPKD, I have to uh, share this experience from the large GenKist cohort, which is led by the breast team in Brittany. And here you have 2,500 patients in this uh, consortium, with which all have uh, genetic tests and uh, uh, followed for a long time. You know the pro PKD score, uh, I'm sure, from this from this team. And uh, a few interesting information from these cohort that's been uh, published last year. The detection rate of uh, inter intracranial aneurysms is around 9% in this population. And two interesting factors have been uh, shown to be associated with the intracranial aneurysms. Hypertension at a, an early age, so below 35 years, that is twice the risk of having uh, aneurysms. And interestingly, the uh, genetic uh, disorder uh, with PKD1 is uh, significantly more associated with the occurrence of intracranial aneurysm. So I'm not sure whether this is a direct uh, role of PKD1, uh, the, the mutated polycystin 1 in the, in the genesis of, of, of the uh, intracranial aneurysms, or if it reflects a more severe kidney disease, a more severe hypertension, possibly also a more severe vascular disease, but that's that's only hypothetical uh, considerations, but it's interesting to, to know. Now, this was for the intracranial arteries, but you also have other arteries that can be the uh, uh, abnormal in ADPKD. And this is an interesting study from Paris, from Claire Bouletti. She studied in, in 61 ADPKD patients compared to 61 matched controls. The diameter of the root of the aorta, the ascending aorta, and what you can see is that there is an, uh, uh, a dilation, uh, an increased dilation uh, in patients with ADPKD at the location of the sinus of Valsalva and also at the aorta root, uh, which are measured here and there. And you can see that this difference is not very important, but it shows that you have some structural abnormalities in ADPKD, uh, which express in terms of aneurysm, but also in terms of mean diameter here of the uh, ascending aorta. Now let's look a bit deeper in the structure of the vessel of patients with ADPKD. What can we see? We can see that there is an increase in the intima media thickness in these patients. This could be either related to hypertension, but also to the genetic predisposition related to uh, mutations in PKD1 and PKD2. This also uh, translates into um, into experimental models. And you can so see here a hypermorphic PKD1 uh, mice. So this is a, a typical model of ADPKD. And in this model, you can see that you have uh, an increase in the thickness of the vascular wall in the mice with the transgenic uh, construction as compared to uh, control mice. Now, these are structural abnormalities, but you also have functional abnormalities. This is a very interesting study that's been published by Eric Honoré, who works in Nice. It's, it was in 2009 in, in Cell Journal. One of the most important um, things to remember from this study is this. They, uh, they did a Crelox model uh, to knock down PKD1 in vascular smooth muscle cells, and they ana analyzed the uh, phenotype of the mice. And this is a study of the, myo the response to myogenic tone 
pressure in the vessel and to make things fraught. The less you have PKD2 in the vascular smooth muscle cells, that is more, the more important the, uh, um, the mutation is, well, the less you have a possibility to uh, produce a myogenic tone, a normal response to the increase in pressure. So vessels from patients, if you, if you do an extrapolation, from patients with ADPKD due to impaired function of the vascular and smooth muscle cells do not respond correctly to the increase in pressure. So structural problems and also functional problems within the vessel wall here in vascular smooth muscle cells. Now let's now go to hypertension. Um, hypertension in ADPKD is uh, very frequent and you can see in this old cohort from uh, uh, the late Dr. Schreier, that you have a mean age of diagnosis around 35 years in, in cohort of cohorts of uh, patients with ADKT, ADPKD. This is slightly earlier in males as compared to females. So it's frequent and it happens early, but how early does it, does it happen? Well, if you look at uh, the prevalence of hypertension in children who have ADPKD, it is frequent. Look at this study, 310 children with ADPKD who do not have um, decreased GFR. And what do we see? We see when you do 24-hour uh, ABPM that 35% of these children have hypertension on the uh, classical uh, diagnostic criteria and that half of the children uh, have a loss of the nocturnal uh, dipping of blood pressure. So you have hypertension early in ADPKD. Another more recent study has studied the, uh, the hypertension in uh, a cohort of 69 children with ADPKD and who have been followed up for uh, uh, a mean of 6.3 years. At inclusion, they were 8.5 years uh, as a median age, as a mean age, sorry, and they were followed for 6.3 years. So what was the, uh, uh, the context at the beginning? Well, uh, 16 patients uh, had hypertension, were not treated. Four uh, were on treatment and, and control, so that was 20% of the cohort. And six years later, there are between 35 and 40% of the cohort which have hypertension, and two-thirds of these patients are treated and controlled. So it's frequent, it happens early, and it is controlled by treatment. Another important thing is that statistically, there is an association with hypertension in ADPKD, early hypertension, before the age of 35, and the occurrence uh, and the progression of CKD, that is the, de the decline of GFR. These are data from the uh, Genkist cohort and have led to the inclusion of hypertension before the age of 35 in the pro-PKD prognostic, prognostic score. Now, how does this work? Well, we all know the old culprit, that is uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This has been shown by several uh, studies. I'm going to show just two studies to illustrate uh, what could be considered as uh, demonstrations that the fact that uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system is activated in ADPKD. Um, this is a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1990 where uh, the renin, the plasma renin activity and the plasma aldosterone were measured in patients with ADPKD and matched controls. And what you can nicely see here is that you have a uh, secondary activation of the renin angiotensin system uh, in ADPKD patients in the supine in the upright uh, position. And also after the administration of an ACE inhibitor, this is a captopril here. So RAS is activated in ADPKD patients. And you can also see this in uh, when you analyze kidneys from patients with ADPKD. Uh, this is also an old study that shows that you have uh, um, an increase in the size of the juxtaglomerular apparatus where renin is secreted in patients with ADPKD. So we'll discuss a bit later a major study that has uh, uh, built on this evidence to uh, introduce the RAS inhibitors as important actors of uh, blood pressure control in hypertension, of course. But well, this is what we all consider to be the major cause of hypertension in ADPKD because um, the cysts, the, the, the main uh, concept is that the cysts will progressively grow, 
creates hypoxia, ischemia behind the cysts because of the pressure that is uh, uh, related to the, the, the growth of cysts, with the one uh, aside the others, and that this, uh, this leads to increased renin and aldosterone and angiotensin uh, secretion. The other culprit is the sympathetic activity. There are quite a few studies, all studies, uh, more recent studies also, that uh, show what it say that suggests that there is an increased sympathetic activity in ADPKD and that this associates with hypertension. This here is the, uh, the muscle sympathetic nerve activity in patients with ADPKD with hypertension. Patients with ADPKD that are normotensive and control patients. So there is a, a relation between hypertension and ADPKD and the uh, sympathetic activity, whether this is primary or secondary uh, remains to be uh, demonstrated. And you can also see what well, this is associated with uh, mean arterial pressure, of course, because it was the concept here. Now let's summarize our current understanding of uh, hypertension in uh, ADPKD. So you have the progressive uh, onset and growth of cysts that will uh, progressively uh, compress, uh, create ischemia uh, in, the kid in the kidney, and uh, this ischemia will lead to renin release and then angiotensin release. Uh, this can in turn activate uh, sympathetic activity and lead to increased systemic vascular resistance. It can also, via aldosterone, of course, uh, lead to sodium retention and vital dependent hypertension. And this altogether uh, gives sufficient background to explain hypertension in ADPKD. This is our current understanding of this disorder. Now, I'd like to challenge this understanding and to go a bit further on the pathophysiology of, uh, of uh, ADPKD within the vessel. So this is an epi epithelial cell uh, of a patient with uh, uh, ADPKD, and you have uh, normal patient actually here, a control patient, and you have the, the schematic location of the, the polycystin complex, which is uh, in several at several points within the, the cell, but most importantly at the at the base of the primary cilia here. Okay, so this complex will allow for the entry of calcium dependent on the urine flow. So this is a mechanotransduction, a mechanotransductory organelle, which is very important in integrating within the cell physiology, the uh, urine flow. Now, what's interesting when we talk about hypertension is that you have exactly the same thing in the endothelium. You have this primary cilia that responds not to urine flow, of course, but to blood flow. And these polycystin complex they are similarly expressed in the endothelial cells at the location of the uh, primary cilia. This is exactly what happens here in the artery. You have the shear stress, which is dependent on the hemodynamic uh, factors within the vessel, which will uh, translate into uh, endothelial uh, cell biology variations according to the mechanotransduction, which is uh, primarily mediated by the primary cilia. Now, how could we study this in patients with ADPKD? Now, the best way to study the endothelium is to directly measure a functional uh, production of uh, how the endothelium works. Now, one of the most important uh, uh, actions of the endothelium is to mediate vasodilation uh, when the blood flow uh, changes. So the shear stress you have uh, on the on the endo on the um, vascular endothelium will increase uh, the uh, liberation of um, NO, uh, this nitric oxide that will go on vascular smooth muscle cells, lead to relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle cells, and in turn increase the diameter of the artery. This is what you call flow-mediated dilatation. So if you have a normal endothelial, this flow-mediated dilatation will work nicely. And if you have endothelial dysfunction, which is very frequent in CKD, then this flow-mediated dilatation will not work correctly. Now, in Rouen, we have um, this, uh, uh, I don't know how you call it, dispositif, this thing that helps to measure um, the endothelial function uh, in patients. Now, this is, of course, the arm of the patient. Here you can see uh, a Doppler ultrasound. 
and uh, we put the hand of the patient in a glove and this glove is within a box where you can change the temperature of the water. So if you progressively increase the temperature of the water here, then you will have a vasodilation within the hand and this vasodilation within the capillaries of the hand will lead to an increase in the blood flow through the artery here. So you can uh, experimentally produce an increase in the blood flow in the, in the radial artery and measure um, the change in the diameter of the artery progressively in this context. So this is what we did in patients with ADPKD. This is a study we published in 2015 in, in KI. And what did we see? Well, here you have the, uh, the, the, the diameter of uh, the radial artery and the mean wall shear stress when you increase uh, the blood flow in the hand, you can calculate the, the wall shear stress with different parameters. So in control subjects, you have a, a, a progressive increase in the artery diameter when the shear stress increases. And this is um, this does not work properly in patients with ADPKD. Please note that these patients were uh, perfectly uh, matched in terms of uh, GFR. They had no hypertension, no cardiovascular risk factors, and they did not smoke. So uh, uh, although it's difficult to manage all the, the potential biases, we had no um, difference in terms of all the things that classically uh, change uh, the endothelial function in these patients as compared to the control. So that was a, a significant demonstration that they have endothelial uh, dysfunction in patients with ADPKD before the onset of chronic kidney disease. And this happens uh, because you have an impaired release of nitric oxide. Now, other, other groups have shown the similar results a bit later. So actually, this is there's no debate that in patients with ADPKD, you do have endothelial dysfunction. And this occurs early in the course of the disease before the onset of um, chronic kidney disease. But this does not demonstrate causality. You cannot say that it's because you have an endothelial dysfunction in patients with ADPKD that this is the cause of hypertension. So we wanted to go a bit further on to test this hypothesis that hypertension could be related to endothelial dysfunction in, in ADPKD and not to the cystic kidney disease and to the activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Now, how did we do that? Well, we uh, studied mice with a specific deletion in PKD1 in the endothelium and looked at what happened in terms of uh, hypertension and other cardiovascular uh, phenotypes. Now, to make things, things short, we had uh, the Crelox model, which is uh, the typical uh, model to uh, uh, create a deletion of a gene in a specific cell type, as you know. So uh, it was the CDH5 that was uh, that is actually right now the best way to uh, uh, to knock down uh, a protein in the endothelium that was inducible. That means that uh, the mice you can induce their deletion by uh, giving them tamoxifen either at birth or later in life. So you have the possibility to have an endothelial knockout early in life or an endothelial knockout a bit later on. Now these mice, when you look at them, so they have an endothelium polycystic kidney disease, but they have no, no ADPKD otherwise. They have no cysts. This is quite logical because the epithelial cells are not touched by the mutation. They have normal kidney function normal kidney histology, normal weight. And when you look at the endothelium with uh, electron microscopy, you can see that they, there is a, uh, a loss of the, uh, the primary cilia, the biggest cilia uh, on the uh, endothelium, which is something that we uh, expected, but had to be shown. So we have the a unique setting that allows us to study the direct contribution of the endothelium of ADPKD to the phenotype, to the cardiovascular phenotype, independently of what happens within the kidney. So what can you see in terms of hypertension? So when you delete PKD1 in the endothelium early in life, uh, at birth actually, and you look five months later on, what happens in terms of blood pressure, you can see a significant increase in blood pressure. This is non-invasive measurement of blood pressure with the plethysmography technique in trained mice which we also confirm this with invasive systolic blood pressure measurement. Of course, this is under anesthesia, so the, the, the levels of blood pressure are lower than uh, if you're not under anesthesia. So hypertension on the one hand 
uh, by plethysmography, on the, on the other hand, by invasive systolic blood pressure. And to make sure that this could not be related to uh, adaptations of the vessel related to the early deletion of uh, PKD1, you could imagine that the vascular smooth muscle cells would change uh, in turn and have compensatory mechanisms that would not directly uh, make the, the endothelial PKD1 um, deletion is responsible for hypertension. To test this hypothesis, we introduced a late deletion of uh, PKD1 and measured blood pressure uh, one month later, and we can see the same thing, that is that the systolic blood pressure increases in the transgenic ice, which shows a direct implication of the endothelial functional uh, alteration related to the uh, genetic disturbance. Now, endothelial dysfunction is, uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, the knockout of uh, PKD1 in the endothelium gives hypertension, but is it also associated with endothelial dysfunction, just like we see it in, uh, in patients? You can do the same thing. You can analyze the response of the arteries to the increase in blood flow. So here we took a third order mesenteric artery from the mice and we uh, mounted these uh, arteries on uh, this device where you can change flow within the uh, artery and measure the uh, uh, change in the diameter. So this is a direct measurement of uh, flow-mediated dilatation in the arteries. And what you can see is that in standard control mice, you have an increase in the diameter that is directly related to the blood flow or to the flow in the artery. And this is uh, disturbed in mice with endothelial PKD knockout. So to summarize, how does ADPKD lead to earlier hypertension? We do not say that the uh, ring angiogenesis system does not play a role, but actually what we can show here, this is demonstrated here, is that polycystins which are expressed in the endothelium do induce endothelial dysfunction and that this in turn and uh, isolated from the other factors can lead to hypertension. Now, let's go to um, the management of uh, uh, hypertension in ADPKD. Now that we've discussed all these uh, mechanistic insights in how hypertension can occur in patients with ADPKD. So I was talking a bit earlier about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And as you most certainly know, there is a very uh, interesting study that's been published in uh, uh, 2014 in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the HALT PKD study with two parts within this study. And this study uh, um, tried to, uh, to test two, two different hypotheses. The first one was to compare standard blood pressure targets. So as you can see, see here, it's 100 over 70 compared to 130 over 80. Two, um, uh, between these two targets, sorry, to a lower blood pressure target between 95, 110 and 60, uh, 75 for the diastolic blood pressure. And uh, the other thing was to compare uh, lisinopril plus placebo as compared to lisinopril associated with an ARP, so tell me salsa. So what happened in the study A, the most interesting one in terms of uh, management of blood pressure. So this study uh, included patients uh, with GFR above 60. They were relatively young patients with ADPKD. And uh, so we compared these two blood pressure targets and the primary outcome was the annual change uh, of the percentage of, uh, to of uh, total kidney uh, volume. So here's the total kidney volumes in the two groups the standard blood pressure group and the low blood pressure group. And as you can see, there is a significant difference with a benefit for the low blood pressure targets uh, in, in this study uh, that was statistically significant. There was no benefit in terms of EGFR over the, the time of uh, uh, the follow-up of this study. Other uh, aspects were studied as um, secondary uh, objectives. You can see that albuminuria and left ventricular hypertrophy were improved in the group with a low blood pressure target as compared to the standard blood pressure target. And shifting to the second part of the study, it was the study B, which compared lisinopril plus placebo to lisinopril plus telmisartan. Or well, sadly, this part of the study did not show any benefit of, a, of, the, uh, of uh, one group as compared to the other, either in terms of uh, total kidney volume or in terms of EGFR. 
So the benefit for a lower blood pressure target shown within this HOUT uh, study, but no benefit uh, for the association of two uh, RAS inhibitors. So what do the guidelines say today? Um, the KDEGO in 2021 published this guideline about uh, the management of blood pressure in CKD patients. And this is the, the small part that talks about patients with ADPKD. Uh, it says that kidney benefits in ADPKD may be greater with a systolic blood pressure uh, between uh, from 95 to 110 as compared to uh, uh, blood pressure between 120 and 130 millimeters of mercury, of course, in the setting of a of a randomized controlled trial, as you uh, as you can imagine. So this is in the guideline. Um, as you probably know, at the end of this year at the ASN, we'll have the specific guidelines for ADPKD, the KDEGO guidelines that are going to be revised. So uh, this will possibly be integrated within these guidelines. But of course, I cannot uh, I cannot say more about that. And I'm not in the guideline committee, so I, I do not know what will be uh, what will be published. There are also pediatric guidelines that have been uh, published in uh, 2019 for the management of hypertension in ch children with ADPKD. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because I think you're all adult nephrologists uh, and I suppose you do not deal with patients with uh, ADPKD. But just to, uh, uh, to remind that the ACE inhibitors in this population are the first line uh, treatment. An interesting question for which we do not have any uh, definitive answer is which is the most logical second line treatment in patients with ADPKD. One of the important uh, interesting uh, results of the HALT uh, APKD study is that uh, generally the lisinopril plus placebo was sufficient to uh, have a blood pressure control in this cohort. So these are patients uh, that are relatively young and that do not have a, a significant uh, decrease in GFR. Uh, so it's easier to control blood pressure, of course, but uh, generally an ACE inhibitor alone is sufficient to control blood pressure. But of course, with the disease progressing and the GFR decreasing, you often need a second treatment and there's no solid evidence-based medicine to decide which treatment should be given in ADPKD, no RCT, no solid RCT. And there are some theoretical concerns about CCB and diuretics, which are of course the second line treatments or the same first line treatments in the, in the general population. Um, for regarding calcium channel blockers, uh, they can lower intracellular calcium within the epithelial cells of the CCD. So this could theoretically increase cystogenesis. And of course, diuretics, either uh, thiazide or thiazide-like uh, diuretics, could increase the release of vasopressin uh, via the follow-dependent uh, mechanism, uh, as, you, as you certainly know. And this is what the KDGO uh, says. Uh, that comorbid uh, conditions may influence the choice, choice for a specific class. And well, uh, of course, in patients uh, who have cardiac disease, beta blockers uh, may be uh, preferred. And in, in patients who have another indication for alpha blockers, these could be appropriate. But this is uh, quite logical, and this is not specific for ADPKD. So when you talk about alpha blockers, some experts say that these should be the second line treatment in uh, in ADPKD after uh, after uh, RAS inhibitors. Um, well, of course, you think about renal denervation. So very little evidence, of course, for renal denervation in terms of blood pressure reduction in ADPKD. I'll just just took the, this slide from uh, uh, from a study published by the uh, the uh, Dutch team of Han Gansevoort uh, in uh, 2018. These are patients who had an indication uh, for renal denervation based on kidney uh, pain, which is quite frequent in ADPKD, um, and they were compared to patients with uh, loin pain hematuria syndrome. And just to just to show that uh, in this study, they had an initial blood pressure uh, of 144 over 91 in the ADPKD group. Uh, and that with the time, there was a decrease, a significant decrease uh, in blood pressure and in the number of, uh, of class of, sorry, it was not significant, but it was uh, of this, this population, there was a, a 
uh, a reduction in the, the blood pressure and in the number of uh, antihypertensive medication. You're on very small cohorts, five, uh, five patients here. So you cannot say much about that, of course, but just to say it, it has been tried in a context of pain. So uh, large bias also in terms of uh, uh, how to interpret the blood pressure in patients with pain. So I'm not a great defender of renal denervation, but uh, when we talk about pathophysiological considerations in hypertension in ADPKD, um, this can also be um, discussed. Um, salt restriction is a major uh, uh, measure in patients with uh, hypertension. So what can we say about this in the ADPKD? So uh, there are Two studies, post hoc study of the HALP trial and another cohort study, uh, observation on that have uh, tried to tackle this issue. Um, the main message is that it uh, that is more associated with the progression of kidney disease to have uh, a salt limited diet as compared to a salt rich diet as compared to protein restriction. Um, this is observational, okay? So it's not an interventional study, a randomized control study, so very very important not to take these results as uh, granted for uh, clinical practice, but probably the salt restriction has a uh, certain benefit in these patients. Then uh, another uh, thing that should be discussed is that in ADP KD patients, we sometimes uh, prescribe tolvaptan in patients who are at high risk of progression of the disease. And so we have here a post hoc analysis of the large TEMPO 3 4 trial, which compared uh, tovapton to placebo in the, the patients with ADP kidney at risk for progression. And what you can see is that, the, that at the end of the study, uh, there is a significant uh, difference in terms of blood pressure uh, with an advantage uh, for the group with tovapton. Uh, it's very unsure to say whether this is directly related to uh, the diuretic effect of uh, the aquaretic effect of talvapton, or uh, if it is related to the fact that there was a, a lesser progression in total kidney volume, so possibly also uh, in stimulation of renin angiotensin in the system and of um, a sympathetic nerve system. And last, uh, in our studies, uh, we also tried to, to test whether dopaminergic signaling could be a potential target for uh, vascular diseases in patients with, uh, with ADPKD. Why did we do that? Because there are experimental studies that show that when you increase uh, dopaminergic signaling at the primary cilia of, uh, of uh, cells that are lacking PKD1, you can uh, re-establish the normal uh, calcium influx and the normal uh, uh, cellular biology uh, and also the, the size of the primary cilia. So uh, in the in the Kidney International study I showed a bit a bit earlier, we published with the endothelial function, there were six patients with ADPKD who received intra-arterial uh, infusion of a very small dose of uh, dopamine and this increased the endothelial function. But of course, uh, we're not going to uh, give dopamine intra-arterially to patients with uh, ADPKD to correct any phenotype. And so we tried to uh, determine whether this could be interesting using another using another approach. And this was rotigotin, uh, which is uh, a treatment that is routinely given in patients with Parkinson's disease and restless uh, leg syndrome also. So uh, this rotigotin works on different dopaminergic uh, uh, receptors, and we randomized in this small monocentric uh, study uh, 29 patients uh, to receive standard support or two milligrams per day or four, four milligrams per day. And then we looked at what happens in terms of flow mediated uh, dilatation. So all these are uh, polycystic kidney disease patients. There are no control patients in this study. And what you can see is that in, in the group with four milligrams per day, you have week after week an increase in the flow mediated dilatation, showing that you can uh, reduce the functional impact of uh, um, the polycystin deficiency in the endothelium of uh, a patient's by giving dopaminergic uh, agonists. This is this also translates in in terms of uh, uh, nitric oxide uh, release. Now, I'd like to finish uh, this presentation by giving you some additional uh, cardiovascular phenotypes that could be interesting in terms of uh, of comprehension of how 
the vascular disease in ADPKD can uh, aggravate um, the cardio, the, the heart phenotype, and also the arteriovenous fistula in patients with ADPKD when uh, the GFR decreases. So to determine whether uh, the endothelium uh, was important in a CKD setting, uh, we had to give uh, experimentally a model of CKD that was independent of the cysts. So we used the 5-6 nephrectomy model and we compared mice uh, with endothelial deletion of ADPKD to controls in the condition of sham, where you did not have the 5-6 the nephrectomy, and in the condition of chronic kidney disease related to 5-6 nephrectomy. So how did we do this? We ligated a branch of the renal artery and in the other part of the kidney, uh, we did uh, with heat the cauterization of, uh, of the part of the kidney. So we only had one third of uh, the kidney left here and the other the kidney was removed one week, one week, sorry, after a surgery. So this is the a typical model of five six nephrectomy, and we looked at endothelial function in these patients. So this is similarly the dilatation of the artery, the mesenteric artery I showed a bit earlier. Uh, when you increase the blood flow, so what happens with CKD? This shows nicely the effect of CKD on um, on endothelial function, taking the control mice. This is what you can see here. These are the control mice without CKD. These are the control mice with CKD. And you can see there is an endothelial dysfunction. Uh, this is evident in patients, but it has been seldom shown in the in models of, uh, of CKD experimentally. And what you can see in when you introduce the endothelial uh, deletion of PKD1 is that this totally uh, abolishes um, endothelial function when uh, mice have the 5-6 nephrectomy. So if you try to translate this into patients, it means that when the uh, kidney disease progresses in patients with ADPKD, they most probably have very severe endothelial dysfunction, more severe than patients with other uh, kidney diseases that are not supposed to uh, have an impact on the endothelium independently of GFR. And this aggravates left ventricular hypertrophy. So we did not have in our model a left ventricular hypertrophy measured by uh, echocardiography uh, in, in sham mice after five months. But when you introduce the CKD plus the uh, endothelial phenotype, then you increase uh, the uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So one of the explanations possibly of the LVH in ADPKD patients, but it's certainly not the only one. And to finish, a little word on arteriovenous fistula. There is a, a large controversy on whether uh, patients with ADPKD have different fistulas as compared to other patients. The clinical studies are very, uh, uh, very low evidence, and the, when you compare ADPKD patients to non-ADPKD patients, uh, of course, in the other group you have the diabetic patients, you have patients with severe arterial diseases. So it's very difficult to know exactly what you're comparing when you look at patients with ADPKD as compared to others for the arteriovenous fistula. But our experience is that many patients with ADPKD have a, an early thrombosis of the fistula. When, when the fistula works, then it goes on quite, quite nicely, but the initial phase of the creation of the fistula is frequently difficult. And so we wanted to know whether this could be related to functional alterations in the endothelium of patients that will not adapt to uh, the change in the uh, uh, the hemodynamics that the arteriovenous fistula creates. So there is a model for this. This is the arteriocava fistula. You just give a puncture here, and then you you put a bit of tissue on it for a few minutes, and then you, when you release it, 90% of the mice have an arteriovenous fistula. And we followed this fistula with uh, with uh, uh, Doppler ultrasound with time, and then we measured different parameters. I'm just going to going to show you this. We published in in the hypertension paper is that you have uh, um, a normal uh, increase in the downstream uh, vein thickness in the control mice, and this is uh, altered in mice with uh, with endothelial deletion of uh, PKD1, which shows that you have an impaired development of the arteriovenous fistula at the initial phase uh, in uh, uh, mice with uh, endothelial ADPKD. This could also translate into patients, but of course I cannot I cannot prove this. So to finish, um, what can we say about 
hypertension in ADPKD with a specific focus on the endothelium? Well, patients with ADPKD have seen develop hypertension early in life, usually even in childhood. The renal angiotensin aldosterone system activation is, of course, the main classical culprit in this context. But I hope I've convinced you that in ADPKD, endothelial dysfunction is present. That's a direct consequence of the deficiency in the polycystin complex within the endothelium, that this is sufficient to, in to induce hypertension. So it's probably very relevant in what we can see in young patients with ADPKD. But it contributes to left ventricular hypertrophy that can see in ADPKD before decreased GFR in some patients. And of course, more and more uh, prevalent when GFR decreases. And it may also impair vascular remodeling in patients with, uh, with ADPKD. So altogether, I would say the endothelium is a key player in both hypertension and some cardiovascular disorders of ADPKD. So with this, I'd like to thank the team I'm working with in uh, the INSERM unit, uh, which is the research lab in which I'm working in the Rouen, and also in the clinical department, and of course, uh, all the uh, all the uh, institutions that uh, founded our work, especially the PKD France, which is a branch of the PKD International Patient Association. And thank you all for your attention. And I hope you have some uh, questions for me. Fantastic. Thanks for that uh, really wonderful overview. Um, you know, I was one of those who thought it was just RAS inhibition uh, or RAS that was a player. So this was uh, eye opening to uh, to a large extent. So if people have questions, please put them, uh, please raise your hand uh, and unmute yourself to ask. But I'll I'll start the ball rolling uh, with a question. So if you know, again, the the evidence you showed is very, very persuasive. Uh, but if we are going to translate that into um, practice, uh, are there agents that we can use that would you know affect the endothelial uh, dysfunction a little bit better? Uh, and if so, uh, should we be doing some kind of studies? Uh, you know, we, we've talked about calcium channel blockers and diuretics, but the, the hard real studies haven't been done. Uh, should we be planning an RCT? Uh, I think RCTs would be very interesting for these treatments, but the, the problem is what would the outcome be? I mean, uh, if the outcome, uh, a logical outcome in terms of ADPKD would be TKV or GFR. And what we know from large studies is that we need a very large number of patients to, to show a difference. So these would be safety studies, not effic efficacy studies on BP, and safety studies with uh, this amount of patients, well, uh, nobody I think will do this. In terms of hypertension, um, if you if you consider the fact that endothelial dysfunction is important, maybe an, another contributor aside RAS inhibition, then probably endothelium endothelium uh, uh, endothelium blockers, sorry, uh, could have a, a place in uh, in ADPKD. There's nothing very convincing to to date, but I think this could be uh, an interesting target in this disorder. Yeah, mm. for sure. Um, Thanks. Uh, there's a question from, I think, Brendan in the conference room. Thanks. That was uh, an excellent talk. Uh, lots of new concepts uh, for me. Um, one question I have, and it's building a little bit on what uh, Swapno was asking, is, is about SGLT2 inhibitors. And I, I kind of wonder, is this the exception in renal disease with SGLT2 inhibitors? Because arguably, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are, are really going to push up your vasopressin levels. They increase your free water clearance, so you're going to get an osmotic stimulus for ADH release. They do produce more consistent ECF contraction than thiazides do, so you, you're going to have a you're going to have a volume uh, release. Uh, but but yet. Um, Every other model of renal disease we've looked at seems to be, uh, they seem to be helpful. Uh, what's your take on SGLT2 inhibitors? Do we need to be cautious? Yeah, gr great question, of course. Uh, as you know, uh, patients with ADPKD have been excluded from all the large studies uh, for uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, mainly because there are experimental models of uh, cystic kidney disease in which SGLT2 inhibitors uh, increase the cystogenesis. So this was a uh, uh, sound that uh, uh, the, industry, the pharma industry did not include them within the studies. But when you see the cardiovascular benefit and the kidney benefit that you have in all the other diseases, I mean, of course, some more than others, um, I think w w it's not possible today not to do a specific RCT in patients with ADPKD to see whether it helps or not. I mean, um, it could be a safety study, but uh, uh, um, 
the industry will not fund this. I mean, I've, I've asked them actually. So uh, uh, the industry will not fund a study in ADP KD patients. But in countries like France, I, I don't know if it's also the case in Canada, but we have uh, we have national funding that could help uh, do such an RCT. I think it's absolutely uh, necessary that one or two countries do this sort of study because uh, do the potential threats for the kidneys uh, really translate into into an increase in TKV or not? And does this outweigh the benefits you're waiting on the cardiovascular and mortality outcomes? I think it's a major question for patients with ADPK. Totally. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And and we do have national funding here. So if you guys are putting a grant together, uh, involve us. Uh, and it would be nice to have a you know Franco-Canadian uh, uh, large trial uh, looking at flows in uh, in PKD. Uh, just to keep going on along the same thread, uh, you know, like so, tolvaptan blocks the vasopressin receptor. It doesn't do anything to the cilia, as far as I know, and it should not do anything to the whole endothelial mechanism. Is there anything to uh, have you come across anything, or have you studied what's the effect of tolvaptan specifically in in the mechanism uh, per se? Other uh, great question. Actually, Tolvaptan is a V2R antagonist, and as you know, vasopressin has other receptors, and there are the V1 receptors on the vessel, and these can be expressed in the endothelium. So I'm not quite sure uh, whether Tolvaptan has, has a neutral effect on the endothelium. It could theoretically actually lead to endothelial dysfunction. Uh, this has to be tested. Um, it's not been tested. Um, we with the with the devices we have here, we uh, address we we wanted to address this question, but we actually did not do it um, because there are not enough patients on Tolvapt on the actually in, in our current practice. But um, there is a theoretical concern for Tolvapt as being uh, a potentially uh, increasing factor for endothelial dysfunction. Actually, that's interesting. Um, so la last question from me. If there are others, please go ahead and and uh, oh, there is one more. Uh, I'll let Kevin go first, and then I'll ask my question. Uh, hi there. Uh, thanks very much for an excellent uh, talk. I enjoyed that. Um, you talked about the deficiency in PKD1 in the endothelium and contribution to hypertension. My question is a bit unrelated to that, but. Do you know if there's any uh, role for the deficiency in endothelial PKD1 in aneurysm formation? Um, in yeah. ADP. Um, I cannot answer this question because this has not been done. Uh, we considered the fact that this could, we have uh, MRI in our lab and uh, we considered the fact to, to test for this. We did not have increased mortality. This is a clear thing in these mice. So there's not a major uh, uh, role in the in the aneurysm generation. Um, the, theory, the theory is that it should be more related to vascular smooth muscle cell and the interior uh, disorder rather, rather than to endothelial disorder. But I, I cannot be certain for this. Uh, I can't. Sure, I would, I would, I would say no, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Ayub. Ayub, you're muted. Thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, have you studied how the endothelium in PKD behaves in pregnancy? No, I have not studied it, and I have no uh, no idea of uh, any study that has studied that. So, um, but I'm just thinking: have you ha have you got an hypothesis that why this should be uh, more aggravated in ADP? Kitty? I'm not sure they have more preeclampsia. To be honest, exactly. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Like you know, preeclampsia is also endothelial dysfunction. And if there is endothelial dysfunction here, we don't see higher risk of pre actually PKD patients with normal kidney function do very well in pregnancy. Yeah, I agree. And their renin levels increase and their aldosterone levels increase. So maybe it acts differently in the milieu of pregnancy. But the, the, there's also something to consider is the fact that the endothelium is a endothelium is a very heterogeneous cell, and uh, the endothelium in the glomeruli it's not the same endothelium as in 
as in the arteries I was studying here. So I'm not quite sure you have the same primary cilia. I think actually you do not have these primary cilia in the, in the glomeruli. So this could be a reason why you do not have proteinuria in patients with ADPKD, and you don't have these classical crosstalk disturbances between the endothelium and the podocytes, which of course, in terms of uh, preeclampsia are a major factor. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's been studied, but I also have the same uh, clinical uh, experience as you, the fact that there's no uh, significant problems in pregnancy for these patients, not more than others, actually. Yeah. I, don't, I think this may be the explanation. Uh, well, preeclampsia is a generalized endothelial dysfunction. It's not just related to the kidney. So anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. But if you imagine that the ADPKD could be a superimposed factor, uh, which is actually the yeah. hypothesis. Well, there's no yeah. reason why you should have a superimposed factor on endothelial cells that do not do not significantly express these cilia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, pretty interesting. So I'll, I'll I'll go from you know basic science and pregnancy to uh, uh, to guidelines again and the halt PKD. Um, so the halt PKD suggested you know lower blood pressure has cardiovascular benefit uh, and poss possibly TKV uh, uh, effect. Do you go in your practice, uh, and I, I understand you have a large cohort of PKD patients, do you go for that intensive target, which is you know pretty intensive, uh, and, and how do you achieve that? Uh, I, I do not, actually, to be honest. Um, I, I try to take all patients to conventional targets, and those who tolerate, which is actually what I also do with other patients with, uh, with CKD, those who tolerate an increased uh, dose of the medications, which is not all the patients, of course, it's Frequently, they are young patients who do tolerate. Then I take them lower, but I, I do not target the blood pressure target that has been shown in heart heart PKD. That does not mean I'm right. I mean, it's just in my practice, I don't go that low. No. And I think it's difficult for guidelines to uh, be opposed to what's been shown in larger RCTs, but RCTs are not the real life. So I'm not quite sure whether this is possible when you only can see patients once every year, once every two years. Um, I'm not fully convinced that this should translate into uh, such strict targets in, in life, but I, I know there is a, a large debate for this. This is far beyond AP. It's a, a debate you know very well. In the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to debate that uh, topic here. And, you know, locally, uh, we also have a PKD clinic, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not part of it. Dr. Brown, Biani, and uh, Pansaka to our, and, and I think they do target lower blood pressures, but exactly like you say, they don't go for the really, really low the way hot PKD was able to achieve. Um, oh, Ayub has something to add there. Please go ahead, Ayub. Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to let you know that we have a database of PKD patients with more than 400 patients in the database. We have almost all variables, including genetic testing. So if collaboration is needed, we are happy to collaborate. Great, great news. <laughs> Question, is, do you have a unit that is able to measure endothelial function in patients? Also? No. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, Kevin has any idea if, if uh, that could be done at uh, the KRC or somewhere else. Uh, I know there are some. Yeah. Certainly, if there. Sorry. Certainly, yeah, we, we can uh, do it. Done. It used to be done with uh, when Rianne was here, but the. Uh, Rianne Towers, um, but unfortunately, we don't have the, the equipment uh, okay. to do this at the moment, but let's hope for the future. Yeah, anybody in nice. OHRI, uh, Kevin, anybody in OHRI has it? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware like of. the Heart Institute? Yeah, perhaps the Heart Institute. Yeah, so we can and certainly that, look into it if that's needed. Yeah. I mean, yeah, of course, as you know, you have to have something better than the others when you do when you do a clinical studies. So one of our advantages is not the cohort here. It's, we have a, a well, 300 patients, but it's not as large as your cohort. And of course, it's not as large as all the very large Mayo or Genkist cohorts. So we, if we want to study something specifically, we have to have the specific material. But we can have a, other ideas together. And the RCT we were talking about could be one. Yeah, but, we, we would be happy to be involved. Mm -hmm. Great. Fantastic. Uh, thanks again uh, for that uh, presentation and for the discussion. We hope this leads to you know more ideas and potentially more collaborations. Um, so um, uh, for the audience, you will get an email with the uh, 
um, uh, evaluation. So please fill that out. We do look at that very seriously and uh, we'll see you all again next week. Thanks again, Dominique. Thanks, Rafnir. Thanks to all of you. Have a nice day. Bye.